Welcome back. Um, and thank you to our speakers for their very informative presentations. Um, I invite our speakers to please turn on your cameras and um, rejoin us for the Q&A. Hello. Um, and to those watching, um, these presentations will be available on our website, c2g2.net, and on our YouTube channel if you'd like to look back on them on share, or share the videos with any um, interested colleagues. So, okay, there's a lot to unpack, and we look forward to learning more during this Q&A session. I do encourage our participants to please enter your questions into the Q&A box, um, but in the meantime, can we start with a high level review of what's happening right now with BEX? Um, we heard that there's only one pilot at the moment. Uh, where are pilots being considered elsewhere? And where is research happening? And how is it being funded? Um, Dan, would you like to address this question? Sure, absolutely. So um, as, as, as I noted in my presentation and as, uh, and as Warren said himself, we are really talking about one um, commercial scale deployment of bioenergy with carbon capture and sequestration that is involving sequestering of CO2 um, for permanent storage in a, um, in a dedicated geologic formation. It's important to note that we actually do have some experience capturing CO2 and using it for enhanced oil recovery. Um, and that's not included in, um, in the estimate when we talk about one facility that's only operating in the world, um, because we're specifically looking at the storage of CO2 in uh, so-called saline aquifers, essentially dedicated storage rather than storage in an oil field. That being said, outside of enhanced oil recovery, we are seeing a few facilities um, being proposed, being developed. Um, as Warren mentioned, uh, there are two um, uh, waste to energy facilities that are doing incineration right now in the Netherlands, both of which are, sorry, forgive me, in Norway, um, both of which are considering and planning to store their CO2 as part of the Northern Lights CCS project. Um, and so I think that will add approximately another uh, million tons of CO2 removal per year. Uh, this is capturing the carbon from uh, municipal solid waste um, incineration, some of which is, is biogenic. Um, as we're definitely jumping on that, I should also note that we're seeing a lot of movement in the United States focused on fulfilling low carbon fuels mandates and producing low carbon fuels, whether that is a drop in fuel, whether that is ethanol, whether that is hydrogen, um, both in Europe and the United States right now. And I think that the fuels sector is going to be the first real opportunity we have to scale up bioenergy coupled with carbon capture and sequestration. I can talk more about the incentives there, but that's what we're viewing in, especially in the United States right now, uh, as the next real opportunity. Great, thanks, Dan. Um, Aspiron, you wanted to jump in? Yes, I wanted to add to what Dan was just saying. And um, let me start with, maybe we start with Norway and uh, the, the, the long ship, the long ship and uh, Northern Lights. And uh, because the actually, uh, there is a lot ongoing in terms of the uh, this component on CCS, uh, which is uh, part of the BEX. And um, uh, the, Dan mentioned that the two projects, actually it's uh, one and a half uh, in the sense that one of the projects, the waste incineration project, uh, then uh, the, um, the the company and municipality also has to come up with uh, about 50% of the funding, which remains to be seen if they're willing to do that. In the, in the other case, which is cement production, actually, uh, the government is funding uh, all, but uh, in both, both uh, in terms of both plants, this has to be uh, uh, adopted by the Norwegian Parliament, Stortinget, which uh, and are, this is on the negotiations now. So this has not been decided yet, but we hope this will happen. There will also be this money then for the Northern Lights, which is big infrastructure in the North Sea both in transporting CO2 and also uh, um, sequestration of CO2 in an geological formation. I also wanted to mention one more thing because I, I, I did emphasize that uh, uh, the cap and trade systems have problems with negative emissions, right? Uh, for instance, the um, emissions trading system of, uh, of, of Europe or EU. But uh, the, at least uh, there are some developments there because uh, I know that uh, there are considering, for instance, to include forestry or negative or fixation of carbon in, in, in forests. So, so land use and forestry is on the consideration in terms of um, trying to include this or linking this to the um, 
uh, emissions trading system in Europe. Uh, how long that will take and how this will develop, I, I don't know. So, so in a sense, I would say that CCS, there is a lot ongoing on CCS, uh, all, all in Norway and also in some other countries. Uh, and uh, whereas I'm, I'm more doubtful if there's much going on in terms of sustainable biomass, because that's a more, more fussy picture to me. And also the combination. To me, unfortunately, I don't think so much is ongoing in terms of combining those two as essential elements, sustainable biomass and CCS. Perhaps it's a good bridge to our next question. Um, we heard a bit about the various forms of governance that will be needed for BECs in order to prevent bad outcomes, um, address risks, and increase the benefits. Um, so maybe Yuba, you can take this next question. What are the ways in which BECs is governed right now? Uh, right now, that will be very difficult to uh, indicate because uh, as that the previous speaker have indicated, there is only one large scale in the US and all those are experimental. But uh, based on uh, different issues that are related to biophysical aspect, related to the social aspect, related to policy, and then the acceptability and others, uh, there is different three different levels of governance issues one have to to look at at the global level, and then that has been also indicated. What will be uh, the uh, uh, what what uh, can expect from the backs in addition to other mitigation options because it cannot substitute; it's a complement, and then one has to have a clarity of. Uh, the mitigation, drastic mitigation uh, option, and then what can expect from the back. And then from that, it's possible to see uh, globally how that can be, uh, um, that can be uh, implemented. And then one can also learn from the EU uh, system, because this is internal EU, it's less complex if you go to global level. This one aspect. Second aspect related to the, the national level, because it will be implemented in a number of countries, and then one have to look at the social acceptability aspect. One have to look at also if there is any competition, because that is not related directly to the back, but in, there were in uh, some concern of many African countries start to say that a land grab issue because of the production of bioenergy, and that is ethanol, because some uh, raise that issue in Southern Africa and other, and then those are some of the issues one has to take carefully, uh, where, where potentially it could be implemented, and then is there a major concern and competition within the land and water, and then what will be the social acceptability in both sides, the production side and the recipient side. And there is uh, many other aspects and that need to be uh, looked at. It's the, the funding also is important. And then will it be competing the other mitigation option funding or there will be a specific funding for that, knowing also that it is not cheap and then all those different aspects need to be uh, look at it in terms of governance. Thanks for that. Um, did any of it, did Daniel or Aspirin, did you have something to add to that? You know, I'll just pick up on one thing that, that Eva said. Um, you know, he mentioned um, the necessity of governance uh, at an international, at a, you know, state or country level, and then finally at a local level. And, you know, when we're dealing with bioenergy with carbon capture, we have this, it's, it, you know, it is, it stresses so many aspects of governance um, um, on those different scales, whether we're talking about the ecosystem or community impacts at a very uh, detailed or at a very, at a very local level, one where we need to be tremendously aware of the social context and understanding that, um, that, you know, we should really have biomass cultivation that serves that serves social outcomes as well, rural livelihoods and and other and other and other long term goals. I think ultimately, ensuring that kind of those kinds of good local and regional implementations of sustainable bioenergy 
will take international agreements around the sustainability of biomass. I think we are just now starting to think about whether um, clubs of nations that are that are starting to scale up their biomass industry or clubs of nations that are starting to uh, procure um, negative emissions, um, how they're going to start working together, how they're going to start using things like um, rapid real-time monitoring and satellite systems to ensure that you know local implementations meet global goals. I, we're, we're just getting started to think about this, but because this involves both land and technology, uh, governance is absolutely essential. Yes, Alfier, please go ahead. Yeah, I had to unmute. Yes, um, uh, I agree to um, what my colleagues have said, but just also to add that in a sense, when talking about sustainable biomass, uh, it's important to understand that these are at least along two, ma uh, two main directions. You have the social part of this because we are talking about uh, land being used for different purposes, uh, agriculture, uh, local use, uh, uh, maybe related to water supply. And, you know, there are all these uh, different aspects of uses of land that are essential for uh, both uh, a local community, but also for a nation to work. And, and so there are competition elements there with if you want to do uh, produce a lot of biomass for energy, uh, bioenergy. But the other part, um, where I'm also very concerned, uh, and you know, we have our colleagues uh, looking into biodiversity and all those aspects of nature conservation and biomass. Um, uh, so we also understand that this also puts pressure or could put pressure on ecosystems, biodiversity, nature conservation, and all, all those values uh, and resources associated with that. Uh, which may need not to have direct impacts uh, on, on human society, but we all know that we are uh, very dependent on those, uh, those uh, systems working and we are putting pressure on these systems. So, so there's also, uh, and then, you know, so biomass um, and sustainable biomass has to work across both these. So one of my concerns actually is that uh, th 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 there is a danger that we put too much efforts or priority to one of these legs. Let's say we, we are only talking about or, to, or talking mostly about the social sustainability. But if you then forget or put too little priority to the nature sustainability or ecosystem sustainability of this, we will be in uh, big troubles. So, so it's, it's also very important that we are able then to balance, uh, let's say, the, the society and nature when we do this. Thank you. That's a really important point. And as a follow up to this statement, um, how can we govern the scale up of BEX for the best outcomes in terms of biodiversity and food security? Are there specific actions we know can already be taken? Um, would you like to start, Yuba, perhaps? I, I, I think that there is a lot uh, we know on BEX in terms of the technical feasibility, in terms also of some economical aspects. But uh, what we don't know, or we have limited knowledge, is all those different aspects we indicated in terms of uh, knowledge and then what will be the consequences in terms of in, uh, social terms. We, we said that it may have some uh, consequences on food security, on uh, uh, you know the different competition between uh, of land, on also on biodiversity. That's the global level, but more specifically, where are the potential areas uh, for back to be operational and then to be viable, uh, to be efficiently, and then what are the different other aspects, and then we need to do more research on those different aspects in order to bring together some of the concerns, the caution we indicated, saying that at the global level, that will not help us in order to bring some key information on the governance aspect. And then those are some of the things what uh, is needed to, to, to look at. It's also needed to look at, uh, is it part of any of the government uh, NDCs 
if it's part of the NDCs, that means that, that there is a some political will of certain government to use it internally, and then so that there is need to do some research on those different aspects and implications so that governance will be much more well informed, at least at the global level and also at the local and national levels. Thank you. I think uh, let me let me jump in. I, I Celine, I think there's a great there's a great example here of um, one place where we have started to set good incentives and start to drive good, um, at least environmental outcomes associated um, with bioenergy and with bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. Um, I want to focus on a, a really interesting policy that we have in the state of California. Um, but it's expanding um, around um, around North America and, and and potentially to places like Brazil and the EU. We have a policy specifically to decarbonize our transportation fuel supply um, called the state's low carbon fuel standard. And what that does is it provides um, a direct intensity to reduce the life cycle greenhouse gas intensity of transportation fuels. What that means is that we are already providing higher subsidies and paying for performance when we're advantaging lower greenhouse gas emission um, biofuels and biomass, what we've seen is that's led to a real preference for waste biomass and other really ultra low carbon biomass feedstocks um, to be used within the state of California. Um, I think waste feedstocks are an excellent place to start. Um, on top of that though, I think we really need to be building an industry that works off of lignocellulosic biomass this is the this is the the branches, the trees, the stalks, the corn cobs, the non-edible parts of what we grow and what we manage. Um, and the California system has started to do that already. Um, we have two things on top of that that make California's low carbon fuel standard a really exciting place for bioenergy with carbon capture. Uh, one is the price. Um, there was a there was discussion. Um, the European uh, emissions trading system is trading about thirty dollars per ton right now to pay, and and of course there are integration issues to make sure that negative emissions are counted. California's cap and trade system trades at about twenty dollars a ton. The price of abatement credits in California's low carbon fuel standard is an order of magnitude higher than that. It's paying about two hundred dollars per ton for carbon abatement in the transportation fuel sector. And California has already gone through the regulatory process whereby they are counting and paying for and ensuring the permanence of geologically stored CO2. So that includes capturing CO2 either from refineries or from fuel production processes, including bio, uh, biorefineries. We actually have pathways whereby carbon negative fuels are given a $200 per ton incentive um, to be produced and consumed within the state of California. I think, again, the, the, the reliance on life cycle greenhouse gas intensities, does it's, it's a really good first step at getting at these broader environmental sustainability goals, and it's a really good way to do performance-based climate policy. Now, it doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't emphasize and include every other aspect of biomass sustainability, both on the ecological or on the social side. Um, that I think we're all talking about here, but it is a good first step. If I may, uh, Daniel, what are specific to California and what are not specific for California in that undertaking? Yeah, so, you know, the life cycle assessment is based on well understood and well developed models, um, actually originally developed by the National Laboratory System in the United States. Um, so the life cycle assessment framework is, you know, could be um, implemented and understood on a really on a global scale. And in fact, we import a ton of fuels from inside and outside of California already, including ethanol from Brazil, for example, um, that, that, that are all really covered by this, this life cycle assessment framework. I think, I think what is, what is, what is missing is, you know, again, kind of, um, a deeper understanding of where that biomass is coming from understanding the real the real the real implications of on the ground both socially and environmentally about what that means and I think there are emerging data science remote sensing and government's needs that I think that need to be um, better fleshed out here <laughs> please go ahead ask your yes uh, I wanted to emphasize uh, the uh, aspect of uh, efficiency of life cycle assessments on this. 
uh, and and this also links to the regional aspect here because um, it's very I, I don't think it's very useful to talk about the kind of global picture here because uh, and I believe my you, you my colleagues also indicating that that, that there are huge uh, regional differences here uh, for just to make an example uh, because uh, what the capacity of potential produce biomass not uh, not least in a sustainable manner varies hugely uh, in terms of regions of the world. And also just to mention one more aspect, for instance, what are the possibilities to um, safely store um, and sequester carbon dioxide? You know, we know, also know that those uh, resources are not evenly <laughs> distributed in the world, right? So that's a very, very important. So to me, it's more like a metaphor. I would say that Bex, you could think of Bex like a machine. And you make you have some inputs into the machine. You have you have to use land. You have to put other resources, uh, also energy, and you, you and you need to put money into it, of course, and make investments and so on. And at the other end, we ho you hope to get out energy and uh, sequester CO2. But remember that every step in the process, from producing the biomass. Uh, uh, to making uh, or, or transforming this into uh, heat or electricity or fuel, and also in terms of the CCS part, there are there is energy used, there are losses, actually substantial efficiency losses. So it's, it's very important then to realize that when we are talking about negative or, or, or uh, producing negative emissions, this all these steps, all this machine has to have a certain efficiency level. Otherwise, you will not in a life cycle is perspective have uh, be able to produce negative emissions right so 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 it's it's um in all those provisions needs to work together to, to make that possible so 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 to me that's that's also an essential part of developing this this, this um, prospect or, or bex is is to have well you have to have the whole, the whole, let's say, chain of these components needs to work together in a very efficient manner. Otherwise, you won't achieve it. I guess linked to what you just said, this sort of begs the question, and if you can uh, maybe answer this, Aspiorn, are there places that should consider the use of BECS and places that should not? Well, I think the key here is uh, more on the biomass side, side than the CCS, even if uh, I, I mentioned you need to store the CO2 or sequester the CO2. But I, I think the, the biomass part and uh, land use competition is more critical. Uh, so I would say that uh, in those regions of the world where you have, uh, let's say, a net uh, production of biomass in forests, and, and especially as I think uh, Dan mentioned also, if you have waste um, uh, waste the biomass that you know you're not really using uh, uh, as according to the potential of this. Uh, you you have a better provisions for doing uh, efficient um, uh, BEX um, activities. So so uh, and and in those regions of the world uh, where there is uh, you know there is either more competition with uh, in terms of agriculture or local use or even and also. Um, uh, ecosystems uh, prospects uh, are much less. So uh, you know we, we can discuss where we will find those regions of the world. But I, I think the key is actually that they put it like this: sustainable biomass use and land competition. I think that is actually the bottleneck here. Um, Yuva, would you like to add something to that? Or no, I, I, I think that uh, it's uh, those different. The, the only thing I want to uh, add on that waste management is a nightmare of many places in the world and then if that could be a route to look that has less impact on competition for land uh, less impact on biodiversity and at the same time it helps uh, you know on the management of this problem but uh, what I'm wondering is not all kind of waste that can be turned to, you know, to Bex. For uh, I guess it will be uh, the uh, uh, turn it to heat because there is limited potential for that for uh, uh, conversion to uh, gas or liquid. And then mm -hmm. one have to look at 
those different aspects. Because I know that in many countries, in many places, including from the north and the south, global north or global south, you say nightmare. If that can be really looked at carefully and then to explore the potential, so that could be a kind of win-win solution. Yes, please go ahead, Asbjorn. Yeah, I, I, want, I wanted to add on that, uh, you know, also an example from Norway. Uh, because we have quite ambitious plans to introduce uh, biofuels in Norway or increase the share of biofuels in Norway. Uh, as it turns out, uh, two years ago, we imported 99% of the biomass to produce biofuels uh, for Norwegian use it, uh, in, from different countries. And, and why is that? Well, because uh, well, we want to use uh, waste or so-called sec second generation um, type of biofuels, you can use waste or it can also be based on forestry, but it turns out that we do, do not have the infrastructure, we do not have the industrial capacity or um, investments sufficient to do that. And, and aside from that, it's also an issue of cost because obviously this uh, producing biofuels uh, from waste and uh, forest products is quite more expensive than using the traditional fossil fuels. So that that is where we are. So there's a lot work uh, or work and investments remaining to be done. But I think a major challenge for whatever we are talking about now is that, you know, uh, we see that uh, in every aspect, because I've been working on this for many years, is that we, we have the problem that the cost of doing uh, or in introducing, deploying BEX and other, and other technologies is much higher than the present value. You no, know, for instance, taking uh, the, the reference point of the uh, $29 a ton in the European trading system. So how can we kind of close that gap? So what NOAA has done, as I mentioned earlier, is that they put a lot of government money into making CCS kind of viable um, uh, and starting up these two industrial projects in Norway and, and, the, and the infrastructure. But we do realize that that is not possible in most countries. So, so a major problem here is that there are, there are very weak or non-existent uh, uh, incentives for industry to engage with this, with a few ex uh, exemptions, uh, Dan mentioned the, uh, from the California, but that, again, that is, uh, as I understand, it's also, polit uh, I mean, it's uh, politically determined or, or introduced uh, frameworks. You know, you make polit political decisions, making this attractive to industry. So that is what we are really uh, lacking, aside from, of course, uh, you buy a lot of research <laughs> because there's so much we do not understand. But I think we need to get starting doing this and learning from practice also. But then you need political frameworks and you need to engage the industries. Did you want to add something, Daniel, before we move on? Or? Oh, gosh. Well, I was just nodding my head in vigorous agreement. But, okay. uh, you know, I think it's, it's, it's important. We, know, we have these studies that think about tens of billions of tons of CO2 removal at scale per year and what that could mean for our land use, for our industry, for our ability to meet global climate change targets. I mean, we're, we are talking about factor 100 to 1,000 to 10,000 scale up of these technologies from where they are right now to where we envision using them at mid-century. Mm -hmm. And there are, there, it's, you know, it's, I, I, think, I think that we both need to ensure the sustainable technologies are implemented, but to make sure that the technology is implemented, at least at a small scale, at least at a demonstration scale, so that we can start to, iteratively learn and scale up these approaches, understand what works and understand what doesn't. You know, there, you know, we, uh, sometimes in modeling studies, we, we think that we can predict everything and show the whole, you know, everything that's gonna happen to the energy system over the next century. I think that as, as Asborn points out, this won't happen until there is supportive climate policy that recognizes the value of pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere and allows things like bioenergy with carbon capture or direct air capture technologies to really compete. So until we get until we get past those first few million tons of CO2 per year, uh, it, it, you know it's so it is hard to speculate about what billions of tons look like. Uh, I think that just if I may, uh, I think it's, it's it's important that we learn from uh, the practices, the experience, rather than rely largely on modeling because with modeling you can do everything you know, it's garbage in and garbage out. Because if you have any constraint and then you can bring some different element, all are related to assumption you make. 
And then we have to more and more rely on the practice and then from different experiences and then to what kind of lessons we can learn from that and then that can feed the policies at different level. So um, moving on, as you've been mentioning, part of BEX is CCS and CCS has a history of use and development and a politics around it. Is CCS the same CCS, sorry, the CCS uh, we're talking about, is it the same as other forms of industrial CCS? And how does this impact governing BEX? Asbjorn, please go ahead. Um, you're muted, sorry. <laughs> uh, basically, uh, the, the, the answer is yes, because uh, CCS, um, uh, of course, that is a family of technology dependent on, you know, what type of uh, uh, CO2 emissions or point emissions we're talking about. It could be uh, related to the cement industry, as I mentioned earlier. It could be uh, attached to or linked to a gas-fired power station and so on. And, of course, you need to adapt uh, the, the the technology to, to the source at hand. And there are also a number of different technologies uh, uh, so, uh, but, but the point is that the main the main main idea with some annotation uh, is the same everywhere uh, because uh, it's methods to uh, to capture CO two from some some pointed source of CO two emission. So, if you burn, for instance, timber in 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 um, or, or forest waste or whatever in 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 um, in in a, in a central plant uh, to produce heat and electricity, then then you get some uh, some percentage of CO2 in the exhaust, and this is then the aim of the capture, which is essentially what you do with the, uh, most of the actually at least um, almost all actually of the existing technologies or the most developed technologies, because there are the technologies that kind of more. Um, uh, actually change or uh, the the whole production uh, process of an industry in order to better uh, capture CO2 but most of these are kind of post combustion technologies so those are the ones uh, that are most um, mature and and you capture CO2 from the exhaust so it's not really much different from other uh, from other let's say uh, capturing CO2 from other types of uh, uh, activities Have you found that there are misconceptions about BEX that impact policy considerations? Dan, do you have something? I'll just start with one, and 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 you'll have to forgive me. I actually um, I'm teaching I'm teaching right now. I need to drop in just a second, um, but um, I think I think the assumptions that BEX was immediately going to be a billion ton scale or tens of billions of ton scale technology. And what that means in terms of dedicated land use in the world is a, is a big misconception to thinking strategically about where to start for small niche regional and sustainable markets. You know, the idea that we are going to need 500 million hectares of land or more land the size of India, land the size of agriculture <laughs> in the United States in order to start to do this technology, it's, it's just plain wrong. Uh, and we do need to think about the billion, the billion ton scale, but not lose sight of, you know, of the loading order and the real near term opportunities to start scaling this technology up. Um, one final question. And thank you so much, Daniel, for, for joining us today. Um, thank you. For all. Your Take time. Care. Yes. Bye. Um, Bye, Daniel. One final question um, before we wrap up. Um, how is BEX impacting IPCC's thinking about pathways um, for 1.5 degrees Celsius as we move towards um, AR6? What about other in other scientific assessments? Um, Yuba, would you like to? But the, the, the point, uh, many have a misunderstanding of IPCC. Because they say that IPCC scenario, IPCC has no scenario. They said IPCC uh, uh, on the uh, on the think there is no thinking because IPCC has to assess the literature and what is in the literature we assess it and then it happened that uh, all kind of modeling particularly integrated assessment modeler and then they use 
that technology in order to look at the potential, the possibility of achieving or not the targeted uh, emission threshold, two degrees or 1.5 degree. And then this base, IPC assessment are based on that. If there were no publication, IPCC will not bring any element of that. And then the more literature that will be, and then the more diverse and then perspective that will be, it will be captured in the IPCC different assessments. Thank you, Asmarin. Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, just a couple of comments on that. Uh, yes, um, so the IPCC, of course, is building on literature. Uh, but uh, I think uh, in terms of uh, BECs and actually negative emission technologies, but in particular BECs, uh, I think uh, the work presented by IPCC and in particular the 1.5 degree report two years back uh, had a uh, had a had a good side and a, maybe a not so good side. But a good good aspect of that would be that it it has raised the issue of need for negative emission technologies. Uh, to a much broader audience. And for instance, uh, in Norway, I, I, I do um, see that more and more people now understand that it's really uh, very difficult to avoid negative emissions and technologies of that, developing that, uh, if we want to be, be really have a fair chance of meeting the uh, climate target in the Paris Agreement. So, so that is a very good uh, uh, effect of, of the, the weight IPCC put, or the literature review, if you like, is Yuba, put on, on, on uh, especially the BECs. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I would say there may be a, a bit, um, maybe misunderstanding or, 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 or what, what the scenarios is about, but, uh, but we do, we have seen uh, also that there uh, have been a number of critical remarks and misunderstanding because uh, in some of the scenarios we know that uh, in the literature done <laughs> but but that also shown in the IPCC 1.5 degree reports showing that there, uh, there is a huge scaling up of BEX because it seems that BEX was very popular in in those scenarios you know mm -hmm. uh, so so um, and you know if you know this field you, you understand well this is model exercises they you know uh, what if I think it's a kind of what if, mm. right? Uh, it's not, but but sometimes people, uh, politicians and others might, uh, in a sense, misinterpret that and saying that, well, we also think this is kind of realistic or viable to have that much of uh, BECs. And of course, uh, I don't think any of the researchers behind this and, and us <laughs> uh, really believes that you can really do that big scale of BECs because, uh, for instance, in terms of land use conflicts and so on, and, and, and ecosystems, that is simply not possible. It's not viable. Mm -hmm. So it's more like a what-if analysis showing that, you know, how much does it take uh, to meet uh, the 1.5 degree? And I think it's, it's been very mm -hmm. illustrative in that sense, but it can also be misunderstood. I, I do agree. The, the problem is that many people will just look at the... <laughs> conclusions rather than the assumptions. Mm. Because there is many assumptions, people will not look at the assumptions. Mm. And then they just look at, they said that uh, it's possible. It's possible, but one have to do in which conditions it's possible. And then those are the models that, that will uh, indicate. And also the question that has been uh, posed to IPCC by UNFCCC is that the feasibility of 1.5 degree and then so that there was a proliferation of modeler, and then they came up different all kinds of scenarios, all kinds of results, but people just don't look overlook the uh, assumptions. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so it's a what if analysis showing you, you know, what, given certain assumptions and uh, use of technologies, various technologies, what is yeah. needed to meet the 1.5. So, yeah. so, so it's not, the, it doesn't say it, BEX is the silver bullet. Exactly. But some people yeah. think that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think that's a very good note to end on. Unfortunately, we've reached the end of our time, but we thank you so much for your time. Thank you for taking the time to share your knowledge with us today. Um, to the participants, thank you very much. Um, it, please in, help us improve the quality of, your, of our events by filling out the survey that will pop up on your screen once the webinar is over. Um, big thanks again to everyone for joining us today, and we hope you'll continue learning with us in our future events. Bye. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye. And thank you. Thank you.